All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Dot LA's Virtual Pitch Showcase. I'm Kelly O'Grady, Dot LA's Chief Host and Correspondent and Head of Video, and I'm gonna be your host for this event. So for those that have attended one of our events before, you're likely familiar with our mission at Dot LA. But for those that are new, welcome. And I just wanna take a second to highlight what our goal is here. So it's no surprise the past couple of years, LA has seen the development of a vibrant tech and startup ecosystem across a number of industries. And that's where we come in. So Dot LA is a news and events company with a mission of shining a light on the innovation in this very quickly growing community. So events such as today are one way that we do that. Obviously, with COVID-19 impacting us all, we've had to quickly pivot very, uh, very swiftly to virtual alternatives so that we can continue to successfully achieve this mission, but also continue to connect with you all. So to get us started, uh, today's showcase, we're going to be focusing on healthcare, which is, of course, especially timely with the COVID-19 pandemic. And to that end, we're pleased to have a very impressive lineup of judges and companies today. On the judges front, we have Jay Goss and Spencer Raskoff. Jay, would you like to say a few words of introduction? Happy to. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, welcome. Good morning, everybody. Uh, at least good morning for those on the West Coast. Um, my name is Jay Goss. I'm one of the two general partners at Wavemaker 360 Health. We're based in Pasadena. We're a seed stage fund. And as the health that our name implies, we only invest in early stage healthcare companies. Happy to be here. Great to have you, Jay. And Spencer, why don't you introduce yourself as well? Hi. I'm Spencer Raskoff. I'm the co-founder and exec chair of .LA. I'm a very active angel investor. I probably have uh, 50 to 60 active angel investments right now. Um, several of them are in healthcare. Many of them are in marketplaces, direct-to-consumer e-commerce um, and other spaces, usually seed or pre-seed, sometimes series A. Um, and um, I was the co-founder and former CEO of Zillow and of Hotwire. Awesome. Thanks so much for being here, Spencer. So I am also thrilled to introduce the three companies we're going to be highlighting today. First up, we will have Giblib. Co-founder and CEO Brian Conyer will be telling us about how Giblib curates and creates high quality educational videos from expert physicians at the leading academic medical centers and streams the library on demand to medical professionals globally. We're also gonna be hearing from Jennifer Saxton, founder and CEO of Tot Squad, whose mission is to help make parents' lives easier by connecting them with the experts that they need, virtually and in person, very important currently. <laughs> and finally, we have Dr. Mickey Pentecost, the co-founder and CEO of Diapdem Biotherapeutics. It's a company that's developing novel engineered exosomes that control immune cells to treat inflammatory diseases. So just a few housekeeping items before we jump in. All attendees are gonna be muted for the duration of the session. Uh, the speakers are gonna be displayed on video throughout the discussion. As always, audience engage engagement is encouraged. So at the bottom of the screen, you're gonna see an icon for Q&A, raise hand and chat. Please feel free to get in on the fun by submitting any questions you have in the Q&A section. If we have time, I will be fielding those uh, to the the folks on screen there. And so if you want to send this to your friends afterwards, a recording is going to be posted on the .LA website by the end of the day. And, you know, have to do a plug here, make sure you sign and subscribe to the .LA daily newsletter to catch every headline. So how's this gonna run? Each company is gonna present for about 10 minutes. We're gonna have 10 minutes of questions and discussion afterwards with our judges. And most importantly, this is a showcase. There isn't gonna be a winner or a loser, but instead we're focused on highlighting some really innovative companies for you and giving you a window into what the process of pitching to elite investors is like. So without further ado, let's get started. Giblib will be up first. Ryan, take it away. All right, thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm gonna actually start by uh, sharing a video. I feel like there is a seismic shift in medicine, but we still have a lot of work to do. There's so much change in technology that we cannot forget that at the end of the day, people are the greatest asset of any organization. 
It's us human beings and the human spirit that we're really looking at. This is a great illustration of preventing post-operative bowel obstructions. I cannot underscore the importance of that enough. What we're going to be looking at today is a really tough case. It's a gentleman that I've known for more than 10 years. We're going to show some techniques to give him a new replacement that's going to last him the rest of his life if we can. The world of medicine is changing. It's changing very rapidly. So much is changing in healthcare. We are rich in opportunities to stay curious <laughs> because because things are really changing. As we look at the health system now and say, so how are we gonna solve the crisis of rural health care? How are we going to connect with our patients in new ways? We all need not just to be prepared for that change, but really drive it forward to really create the future that we want to see. We have to grow the next generation in a way that they can meet the needs of the future. To be bold, to be innovative, to be honest, to work with pure integrity for the betterment of our patients. The only job you have is to do the right thing. All right. Well, good morning. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Brian Conyer. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Giblib. And just to confirm, let me know if you can see my uh, slide deck now. Yes. Okay, great. So uh, in the medical community, we become uh, known as the Netflix of medical education. Uh, what we actually do, though, is we film subject matter experts at the leading academic medical centers. In fact, we partner with six of the top 10 hospitals in the U.S., and then as an LA-based startup, uh, Hollywood is very much in our DNA and, and we create really high quality studio quality medical education content um, because we believe that you have to have the most compelling and engaging uh, content to really engage an online consumer. And then last, we stream on demand to a global audience of medical professionals. Uh, it's our belief that everyone in the world should have access to learn from the, the absolute best. So on our platform, you'll see two types of content. First are medical talks, which include scientific lectures, voiceover PowerPoints, intimate one-on-one -on -one discussions uh, covering the most trending topics in medicine. And then second, surgical videos that are fully narrated with the expert surgeon. So physicians and, and residents can feel as though they're learning right there next to that, that expert. Uh, but most importantly, and especially during uh, this time right now with COVID-19, where all the medical conferences have been canceled, uh, physicians earn continuing medical education credits as part of uh, watching these videos. Brian, if you're advancing your slides, they're not advancing on, oh, on, at least on my not, screen. Not seeing that either. Okay. Let me uh, try this one more time. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I'll just get back to where we were. So our, um, our subscribers are able to view content in three different ways. Uh, our workhorse is our web video where physicians will watch our videos. They can also conveniently learn uh, through our mobile audio app. Uh, this is a growing popular um, product of ours where we find that physicians <laughs> are in lectures during their morning and afternoon commutes. And then we, we also offer a virtual reality um, application uh, to provide a more immersive experience for the younger audience like medical students and, and the simulation labs at the medical schools. So we generate revenue uh, one of two ways. First, and our, our main um, focus is our subscription model. And then second, uh, through our sponsored content where we work with industry, both medical device and pharmaceutical companies. So month over month, we continue to grow our subscriber base. Uh, with COVID-19, what's been most interesting is on a cash basis, in the month of April, we actually doubled our, our gross revenue. And as of this morning, um, we hit our what we achieved in, in the month of April. So we're seeing tremendous growth for sure because of um, the lack of medical conferences and the need for education uh, on an online basis there. Uh, one metric that we continue to boast is the 50% free trial to paid user conversion rate. So every two physicians that 
uh, view our platform or try, try it out for four days free, one will convert to a paid user. And we continue to focus on our retention, making sure that uh, we implement uh, successful onboarding uh, resources so that way we can be uh, of value and deliver value for the entire life of a uh, physician career. So our engagement has really increased over the last uh, several months. Right now, in terms of our paid subscribers, nearly 100% will visit on a monthly basis, 33% uh, visit on a weekly basis, and each of those weekly active users will watch on average about four videos per week. And as I mentioned, uh, again, because of our daily releases of COVID-19 updates, our increased releases of trending topics across all specialties, and then the more engaged users, uh, we've seen a 12 and a half times user growth in terms of weekly video views on our platform. So our primary focus in the historically has been our direct consumer, but now we're shifting to a enterprise approach. We currently have a pilot with 47 hospitals um, across the globe that are evaluating our platform uh, to, to provide education for their physician audience. In addition, uh, as I mentioned, we generate significant revenue from medical device and pharma companies, Medtronic and Intuitive being primary drivers of our growth there, uh, where we create custom training content and now rolling out a new product where they pay for sponsored channels featuring their subject matter experts and key opinion leaders, as well as educational pieces of content featuring their technologies. Um, we've had our industry partners actually show the efficacy of our content that we create for training and um, here's some of the data that shows that. So looking ahead at our 2020 product roadmap, there's two key themes that we're focused on. First is the personalization. We have a wide range of physicians on our platform from uh, community-based to academic medical centers, primary care into surgery. And so we want to, based on that physician demographics, viewing history, interests, be able to personalize the experience for every physician that comes on and better predict what education is important for them. The second component, as I mentioned before, uh, you know, we film subject matter experts at the leading academic medical centers, not just in the US, but focus abroad as well globally. Um, and as part of uh, the platform, we want to uh, implement uh, NLP technologies to provide that voice to text translation. So all corners of the world, even the non-English speaking ones are still able to learn from our medical content that lives on our platform. So to date, We've raised about three and a half million dollars in funding. That's allowed us to build out our early platform to scale our content from these academic medical centers and to continue to uh, accelerate subscriber growth. Um, our focus now moving forward, as I mentioned, is, is our enterprise strategies. Just in the last uh, two months, we've onboarded about 30 medical schools, several residency programs. And as I mentioned, we have the big pilot with the, the um, hospital systems as well. So here's a look at our team. It's broken down into three main functions, our business team, our video production and content team, and then our technical team, of course. Um, I have about 10 years of healthcare experience prior to starting GiveLib, uh, where I was in the medical device industry, working at Intuitive Surgical, which is a robotics company. I met my co-founder, Jihei, in business school at USC. And prior to quitting her job uh, and joining my side at GiveLib, she was the manager of digital content distribution at Paramount Pictures. So we, we from the onset, said that we were going to uh, take the best practices of entertainment and apply it to medical education. Uh, our head of production, Mitchell Runyon, uh, is a former creative in Hollywood. And then our technical um, or CTO is a physician by training, uh, having two prior exits under his belt, uh, one of them being an AI diagnosis company that, that he later uh, sold. So that's the general overview about GibLib. One thing that we're extremely excited about is the, the shift to online education, especially for the medical community. We're extremely well poised and you can see in the, the early numbers of the last couple of months, uh, what, what's in store for us in the future. Uh, so I'll go ahead and open it up to questions. Thank you. So the, this is Jay. Uh, the last thing you said was the question that I had, which is, well, certainly nobody's rooting for the pandemic, we're rooting against it, your business model benefits from it. You talked about the 47 hospitals and the 30 uh, other programs that you're working with at the enterprise level. Do you have a sense of how much uh, wind at your back that's creating? And, and almost, I know we only have nine or 10 weeks of worth of sample size, but 
how much is this changing the way the enterprise customer is evaluating GiveLib? Yep. So I'll break it down into kind of the three segments. Um, so first is the hospital systems. You know, physicians uh, are mandated to uh, not travel. They typically get education budgets to spend on conferences. All the conferences are canceled through the end of the year. So we know the hospital administration is looking to continue their education, but uh, the main source has been these physical conference spaces. So, uh, you know, the, the circumstances are definitely unfortunate, but we are truly becoming a digital alternative to that physical conference space. And we also provide an economic benefit to these hospital administrators who, you know, will on average give five to $10,000 uh, per physician to spend on education um, and now can, can uh, uh, gain that online. Uh, from the medical school standpoint, it's been really interesting because uh, some of the early medical schools that are very innovative have adopted the kind of the reverse classroom. Uh, but for the far majority of them, they've been really stuck into this um, system that is, is based on um, tradition. Because of COVID-19 and these medical students now not having access to the hospitals, um, We've seen a lot of medical schools, Dean of Curriculum, Dean of Education, reaching out now and sit, scrambling to find online resources so they can map it to their current curriculum. And then the second step is how do they implement online curriculum moving forward permanently? So this has been very much a forcing function for these schools now to look at the uh, solutions that are out there. And, and GiveLib, of, of course, is being one of them. Uh, and, and we've been very fortunate in that situation. The third thing that I'll state is kind of like these residency programs, uh, also physician assistant programs, nurse practitioners, and a lot of the allied health profession um, uh, education systems. Again, similar to the medical schools, they need to provide and integrate education, and, and they just haven't been well poised to do that previous. And, and this is a force and function for them as well. So we actually have a number of PA programs and NP programs that we're also onboarding as we speak. Brian, so one of the goals of these events is to try to give uh, other entrepreneurs kind of a window into how VCs and angels think about companies. So I'm going to tick through like the seven questions that I have, and then I'll just conclude <laughs> with the last one for you to answer. So I'm interested really quickly in um, the brand positioning and, um, you know, is it positioned as like entertainment or education? Probably a little of each. How do you, how do you thread that needle? Number two, selfishly, I'm interested in the impact of being based in LA, if that's been, you know, helpful, hurtful, et cetera. Uh, number three, I'm interested in competition, other online competition. I get that conferences are, are kind of the traditional competition. Number four, I'm interested in the product offerings, if you focus on it, on growing it by specialty. Um, and if so, are there specialties where the library is particularly built out and others where you haven't uh, built it out? Um, num the next, I'm also quite interested in um, the uh, the sales strategy. It seems like it was originally B2C. Now it's a little bit more B2B2C, try to sell through the hospitals and, and other academic institutions. And, and I'm interested in that. Um, I'm interested in the uh, supply side of the marketplace. So how hard is it for you to acquire content? How much does it cost? What are the unit economics of creating an hour of content? Um, uh, somebody asked that in the chat as well, kind of, you know, is it hard to acquire content and, and create content? Um, uh, I'm interested in the funding, the three and a half million, how far has, well, we see how far that's gotten you, but what's your burn, what's your runway, kind of what's the funding situation? So you can't answer all that in the time we have. So maybe let's just focus on, on customer acquisition. Um, and kind of the B2C and B2B2C customer acquisition uh, focus. Yeah, actually, I, th I think I can I can give it a quick shot at answering some of the early okay. ones. Um, <laughs> so entertainment versus education, absolutely. I think to be a really strong educational platform, you do have to have an entertainment approach. That's where we say high video production quality actually matters, and you have to engage that online consumer. So that's why we... Um, put so much emphasis on the video production. And also we look at the subject matter experts as kind of Hollywood movie stars, right? You look for the people that are at the podium that draw a big auditorium, uh, uh, you know, standing room only type scenarios. Uh, being in LA, it definitely helps us because we have both the technical uh, capabilities and then we have the entertainment approach um, and with the video production uh, and access to talent there. In terms of competition, we look at medical publishers as a major um, competitor, you know, the ones that struggle to go from textbook, traditional print to online um, media and, and being able to monetize that. Uh, for product offerings, you know, we want to um, provide platforms that allow the busiest people in the world being physicians to learn at their convenience. So, you know, video is our workhorse, but we know it's time intensive. What we're finding is a lot of, the, especially the older physicians passively learn through the mobile audio app. And as long as we 
take the entertainment approach and continue to release content week after week, um, it keeps that engagement uh, right. going. So we, we treat it much like a, a inventory, like a, a studio would schedule a release. Um, and then in terms of sales strategy, it's actually a B to C to B approach. In order to get adoption, we have to take the bottom up approach. We have to get physicians using the platform. We have to get internal champions. And then at that same time, we work top down and you know we build the economic story. We build um, the value that it offers to these physicians um, from an institutional level. Have you been able to get the hospitals or medical schools to pay for the subscriptions for their docs or the docs are still paying themselves? Yep, uh, so both. So that's last month we onboarded three residency programs. Uh, right now we have several medical schools that are getting ready to purchase. As I mentioned, the growth that we saw last month on a cash basis came as a result of both CME and institution. Today, officially we generated the same amount of cash that we did in the entire month of April because of one medical school that just um, purchased. So uh, we're gonna see a lot more of that as, as um, we get further in that pipeline. From the supply side, uh, this is really our secret sauce, um, you know, and, and this blends in with the entertainment versus uh, uh, education. We're the entertainment side where we dress up the content. We rely on our academic medical centers to provide the, the supply of the talent and the physicians. Um, one of our main partners and investors is Mayo Clinic. They do over 300 live courses per year. So that provides us, um, you know, really um, uh, positive unit economics from a cost perspective where we not only digitize that and license that content from them to get the quantity, but we can also look at our analytics and piece together which topics and which physicians are most popular and, and create that uh, more compelling, engaging content. So every hour of filming takes us maybe anywhere from four to 12 hours of post-production, but we selectively pick which we're going to invest. And are you editing and adding a, an, an intro and outro and sound and, and music? Or Yep, like absolutely. How? I mean, that's why I wanted to show kind of that um, sizzle reel in the beginning. Um, these courses are very much um, kind of instructional, intimate feeling, make you feel oh, you're learning from that expert. You can chapterize it, you know, you can be a little bit more engaged than just a, a podium talk with a a camera on the PowerPoint. And then funding, again, you know, content is an investment up front. Um, we had to build out the platform. We had to build a brand, especially to show that for a skeptical community like physicians that we are a trusted uh, platform. But because of our partners, we've been able to piggyback off of that. And now we're to the point where we're starting to finally see all that work from the CME implementation, the content creation, and the, the steady pipeline of content, um, the acceleration of growth in our subscriber base. Thank All you. Right. Uh, Jay, Spencer, any final thoughts before we, we say goodbye to Brian? Yeah, just one. I'm embarrassed that I don't know the, uh, the answer to this question because I should. R remind me at least, and for everybody else, what is GibLib? What, what's behind the name? Yeah, so Lib is obviously a shorthand techie, you know, way of saying library. And Dr. John Gibbon was a very famous uh, physician uh, in the 1900s that came up with a game-changing procedure. And we said, had he had a, a platform like GibLib, he would have been able to teach the entire world about this procedure and, and save the lives of, you know, millions of patients. Um, parting thought, I, I kind of love this. Um, I should have uh, said up front, my wife is a doctor. She's a pediatric rheumatologist. Um, I've watched her. You know, I watched her go through med school, fellowship, residency, or, you know, and on her ongoing education and ongoing accreditation. And um, uh, a platform like this is, is really smart. And I was on the board of Seattle Children's Hospital for many, many years. I can see why this would be really interesting uh, on the hospital side and on the medical school side also. So um, I, I think this is really cool. Uh, congrats, Brian. Well, I'll, well, I'll be sure to, to send you login credentials for your wife so she can- I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. Congrats. All right, thank you. Cool. Company. All right, thanks, Brian. Uh, next, we are going to hear from Tot Squad. So take it away, Jennifer. Oh, Jen, you're on mute. All right, I'm just working on sharing my screen here. Can you see it? You're good. I'm good to go. Okay, awesome. Hey, guys, nice to meet you. Um, I'm Jen Saxton. I'm the founder and CEO of Tot Squad. Uh, and I just finished Techstars on Tuesday was demo day. So I'm going to share my demo day pitch deck with you today. So a few years ago, while I was completing my MBA at Kellogg, I started a company offering baby gear services like car seat and stroller cleaning and car seat installation. 
I built a successful brand, served tens of thousands of new parents. We generated more than two and a half million in transactional revenue, and we established key partnerships with major retailers like Amazon and Walmart. And then 18 months ago, my world changed when my daughter Charlotte was born. Uh, it was crazy because I received so many products off my baby registry, but I don't have any family that lives here in LA or in the entire state of California. And uh, I realized what I really needed was help, not stuff. I was totally overwhelmed and I quickly learned that there were so many more challenges facing new parents than just dirty strollers. So my mom, friends, and I were spending a ton of money, a couple thousand dollars on a night nurse, thousands of dollars on sleep and lactation consultants, baby proofers, night nurses. I mean, just the categories go on and on. We've identified over 60 categories where new parents are spending money. These are completely fragmented, small business-driven industries. A lot of the providers in these categories are stay-at-home moms um, who kind of run part-time small businesses. And... I realized that researching and booking all of these service providers turned out to be an astronomical undertaking. Uh, and I thought there's got to be a better way to do this than asking for help in Facebook groups uh, and then trying to go through hundreds of comments, uh, different websites, trying to figure out which sleep consultant does the cry it out method versus the one that uh, has the more new age approach to sleep training. So I read a Forbes article last year that pegged this new mom economy at $46 billion annually. And I realized that my friends and I were not the only people. Um, from conception to kindergarten, new families are spending ten dollars to $15,000 on all the types of services. Um, and they're relying on an entire squad of outside experts for support. So I noticed I was paying a premium for all these providers to come to my home when it seemed like so many of these services could be offered for less over video chat. Um, as you can imagine, over the last six weeks, we've seen the most rapid adoption um, by consumers of telehealth, and the industry is soaring past $150 billion. So today, Todd Squad is a telehealth marketplace that connects new parents with all the health, wellness, and safety services that they need. We're revolutionizing parenthood, making services rather than just products, a must have for every baby registry. We're building a one-stop shop of vetted pre and postnatal pros, offering services both virtually and hopefully again soon in person. Uh, we are aggregating hundreds of thousands of providers ranging from car seat installers to potty training experts and helping them adapt their businesses to digital fulfillment to reach new families. Our distribution channels are our unfair advantage. We are the only partner bundling baby-related services with products on both Amazon and Walmart. Uh, you can see here on the Amazon screen uh, where you can add professional installation. Uh, that service is offered exclusively through Tot Squad nationwide. Um, and we are launching next week on a parenting media site that has over 30 million in monthly audience uh, as their exclusive services as well um, as they launch a new e-commerce platform. So these key partnerships allow us to acquire customers in a scalable and cost-efficient way. Effectively, we are only paying a variable cost to acquire a customer. We have a 50% gross margin on a service that's sold through a retailer. So there's no LTV to CAC ratio that has to um, turn right side up. We make money on the very first purchase. And then once a new parent has their first experience with Tot Squad, we can join them on their parenting journey using an ages and stages approach to connect them with all of the services they need for their growing family over time. Uh, this is great from a disintermediation perspective. Um, if you think about marketplaces with like massage therapists, after you've found a great one, you cut out the, the platform and get a cheaper rate going direct. Our parents are typically type of service pro for each service every couple of weeks. So there's very low disintermediation risk on our platform. So during Techstars, we successfully sold that original baby gear cleaning business so that we could focus on this bigger opportunity. Um, as an aside, I don't recommend M&A transactions during global pandemics. It's quite stressful, but we got it across the finish line. Um, we are reinvesting the proceeds from that sale and leveraging Top Squad's established national brand to build out the first ever baby services marketplace. So when new parents visit our marketplace, they can choose whether they would like Top Squad to match them with the first available provider at a flat rate, or they can browse our directory of vetted professionals. Um, again, if they want to find a doula who uh, is focused on unmedicated births, 
um, and doesn't believe in epidurals, they would be able to filter and sort by the different parameters and parenting approaches that fit their lifestyle. Um, and whether they're looking for help quickly or they're searching for that perfect provider that aligns with their philosophy and approach, TOTSquad makes the discovery, coordination, and booking of service providers simple and convenient. My team includes startup veterans uh, like our head of product, Matt Quinn, who's a serial entrepreneur and baby industry experts in key roles and on our board. Um, together, we booked more than $100,000 in the last three months um, from Fortune 500 partnerships and through our marketplace and demand is growing rapidly. Um, during shelter in place, new parents are facing an even, even more overwhelming set of choices and challenges. It's no longer just trying to choose from the lactation consultants locally in Los Angeles with everybody online, trying to find a provider out of the hundreds of thousands of them all over the country is really overwhelming. So Tot Squad stands ready to help them navigate this life-changing transition to parenthood by delivering the support and services they need. Again, as millennials tend to live farther away from their families, it's not like you're in your home with your mom and your grandma showing you how to breastfeed. Um, and right now, extended family can't even travel to be with you as you welcome your baby into the world. So we're fundraising now to take advantage of this rapidly changing industry. Stay-at-home orders have decimated a lot of these small businesses and we're at a critical juncture. If we move quickly, we can help get a lot of these providers online and into our platform. This is a winner take all market. And if we aggressively aggregate the supply, we can own this white space. It's a fragmented industry that is ripe for disruption and Top Squad's opportunity is now. Thank you so much. Cool. Thanks, Jen. Um, I'll, uh, I'll go first here. Um, so I'll take the same approach I took to Brian. I'll give you too many questions for you to have time to answer. And then you can kind of pick one or try to do them all like Brian did. But so here's what I'm interested in. Um, I'm interested in what changes uh, you as an entrepreneur or the company underwent during the Techstars program. If you think mm -hmm. about, you know, at the beginning of the end, obviously you sold off the business, but, yeah. but you know, any changes in the strategy or in how you approach things through Techstars. Um, I'm interested in the TAM, the total addressable market. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a, a little nervous about the TAM. I, I would uh, really want you to drill down to TAM by segment, you know, is really all that matters is the, you know, lactation consultant marketplace, but these other 10 marketplaces are actually relatively small. So really all the money is in this one, you know, et cetera, kind of TAM by segment. I'm interested in how you vet the quality of the service providers. I'm interested in you, if you have data on connections per user, Basically, um, the ability to cross-sell somebody, as, as you point out, one of the problems with these marketplaces is it, like a dating site. If it's successful, they have high churn because you meet okay. your mate and you're out. Um, and you could say the same thing about, you know, like a, a housekeeper marketplace or something. If you're okay. successful, it's on, you know, then you're out. And one of your value props is this kind of cross-sell. And so do you have data to support that? And likewise, I'm interested in the competition, particularly care.com is, is one that I think of, and I'm sure there are others. Um, so that's too many for you to answer. Um, maybe maybe uh, focus on Tam, uh, to, and then and then I'll let sure. Jay, Jay jump in. Uh, so I think one of the the things that's really exciting about this space, right? I have a decade of industry in the baby in the baby industry, and until I became a mom, like I didn't identify this opportunity, and there's not even really a category name for it. Um, services from preconception and fertility through pregnancy, through early childhood, like it's really hard to describe it. So because of that, there's not a ton of market data. Um, and I, I think it's a double-edged sword, right? Like it's great. It's a white space. Nobody has done this yet. There is definitely an opportunity to aggregate all these service providers, but there's not a ton of data. That said, anecdotally, we've got great data that sleep consulting uh, is a huge category, lactation consulting, baby proofing, um, and doulas, 15% uh, of new families are using doulas and that is actually a really rapidly growing industry. Um, a doula, if you don't know, is a childbirth labor and delivery coach um, who comes into the delivery room with you or during COVID is actually on Zoom um, doing your breathing exercises with you. So uh, TAM, based on the Forbes data that came out last year for these group of services, we believe is about 12 billion. Um, so it's definitely a very, very large industry. But that's, but that's the revenue that people pay to all the doulas, right? So you have to think about Correct. what would people pay to find 
the 12 billion, right? Right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and so the way I think about our business model is, right, we're acquiring the customer on a variable cost basis. And then um, we make that 50% gross margin on the first purchase. And then it operates very much like a marketplace from there where we're just skimming a percentage of each transaction. Our take rate right now in this introductory phase is only 10%. But as we bring in a lot of this demand coming through the mass retailers and, and mass parenting media sites, uh, we expect to be able to replace any marketing that these providers are currently doing and increase our take rate up to about 20%. Um, so to answer your question about tech stars and how the business was transformed, uh, I basically went from running a services company to running a tech company. So instead of directly delivering the services, we're helping connect people to the services. So even though I have an MBA from Kellogg and a math degree, like I've never built a tech company before. So it was absolutely transformational for me to go through the mentorship experience and learn about testing and iterating and hypothesizing, like really understand your assumptions um, uh, on the product development side. Um, going through customer interviews, we were really able to crack the nut on what this problem was, right? As a new mom, I had seen, like it's annoying trying to find this, you're asking for all these recommendations, you go to this one sleep consultant's website and they've got a $500 package and a $900 package and the next sleep consultant has a $300 and $1,200 package and you don't know what they mean. So this industry is really lacking both trust and transparency. So one of the key features on our platform will be a lot like Urban Sitter. It's a social graph. Being able to see who your friends have used, which may actually help you decide, I don't want that provider if so-and-so used them. Um, so the social graph will help with the trust side. And then the transparency, we're requiring every provider to actually provide an hourly rate instead of these obscure packages so that you can actually compare apples to apples in making your decision. So, so that was the transformational part of Techstars. And then go ahead, Jay. So I'll, I'll, I'll hit you with just two questions. Uh, the first one is you mentioned uh, discovery, coordinating, and booking, but I wanted to drill down on the booking. Uh, mm -hmm. So the first question is, is booking code for you're scheduling the appointment, but you're not facilitating the payment, or are you actually facilitating the payment? We are controlling the payment. Uh, so I, I've been talking to one of the uh, board members at Thumbtack, uh, has been kind of informally advising me and, and potentially considering an investment in the future. Um, and he said, like, that is the secret sauce. That one of the, the key advantages that we have going for us is the fact that we control that transaction. And the other thing that will help keep the providers really loyal on our platform is that right now, there is a very um, word of mouth driven referral based system where the lactation consultant is constantly referring to sleep consultants and vice versa because their services are very much linked. But there's not a single platform where you can consolidate notes about the mother baby dyad and a way to track that referral. So if the lactation consultant can actually monetize a small affiliate fee for keeping the referral to another provider within the top squad platform, that's not an ability that these small business owners have right now. So we think we can really build that ecosystem. Yeah. And you, and you had me at hello. I, I think it's so, so critical. The marketplaces that we look at that don't take care of the payment are far less interesting to us. If for no other reason, it's just a, it's an industry where both parties hate the payment process. The payer <laughs> hates paying and the receiver hates receiving. They're not built to capture money. Yeah, the way totally. And, and a friend of mine paid $1,200 for a doula in Dallas. And then the woman ended up at a different childbirth the night my friend went into labor, never showed up at the hospital and never refunded her. So having a more professional platform that can either like share the notes to find you a backup provider on the spot or refund you and offer that service guarantee is really needed in this category. Mm -hmm. And then the, the second question was just geographic traction. Are you, wh where are you? How many of the football cities are you in or are you really just focused on one market right now geographically? Yeah, since we're focused on virtual services, um, the location-based um, kind of growth that you would see in a traditional um, offline marketplace is not as important for us. Um, in the legacy business, before I closed those deals with Amazon and Walmart, which we kept um, as part of the divestiture, uh, we had recruited hundreds of car seat technicians all over the country to be able to bundle that car seat installation service with car seats and service national accounts like Amazon and Walmart. So we really do have a nationwide presence. And then for the virtual services, it's infinitely more scalable because you can start with just a handful of providers. And as their schedules book up, then you get a couple more. Um, so you don't actually have to hit that critical mass in any single market to be able to make waves. It looks right. like Kelly's uh, come back on the screen probably to, to give us the hook. Um, I, I want to just close with... Um, uh, one comment or suggestion. Um, if you can make the profile pages of the service providers uh, have, have valuable content that 
makes them makes the service provider think of it almost like their website. Mm-hmm. And, and um, you know, like Zillow's profile pages for their real estate agents have really replaced real estate agents own websites um, as kind of the, you know, the online presence for the real estate agent, hotel detail pages for on TripAdvisor, for example, you know, et cetera. Um, then you can get great SEO, um, you can get traffic, uh, you can create like a review widgets that you put on the service providers on the website to send you to, you know, to, um, to your site. And that's, those are important. That's an important link building strategy to drive SEO uh, to your site also. Um, and one of the features that care.com does that, that I think is cool is um, in the directory, it shows how quickly the service provider usually responds. So, mm-hmm. so it usually gets back to you in three hours or, you know, usually gets back in 30 minutes. Yeah. That's a really good incentive. You know, if you, if you have that transparency, it makes the service providers be more. Totally. Responsive. Well, and again, we, we will have an option to just c- get connected with the first available provider. So if you're like, you know, cool. you have an urgent lactation consulting question and you don't need to like sort through all the specialists, you just need somebody who knows something, uh, you'll be able to get connected with somebody as quickly as possible. Cool. And Thank then, and then such a pleasure to meet you. last, last comment that um, you clearly have one of the things that I look for in investments, which is founder product fit. I mean, clearly you're passionate about the problem. Um, in fact, you were a, a provider in your own vertical marketplace when you were doing the offline business. Um, mm-hmm. and, and then you sold that. So, you know, you have experience as a, as a parent, but also as a provider in the marketplace itself. So that's impressive and definitely something I think investors look for is, is somebody, a CEO and founder and founding team who really cares passionately about that specific problem, which you clearly do. Thank you. Thank All you. right, Kelly, back to you. Well, uh, any final thoughts from you, Jay? Nope, I'm good. I'll take the hook. <laughs> All right, thanks so much, Jennifer. So now we have our final company, Diadem Biotherapeutics. So take it away, Mickey. All right, thank you very much for having me. I'm gonna stop my video just to uh, save a little bandwidth and share my screen. Please uh, let me know that you can see the screen. Great. So I'm Mickey Pentecost, co-founder and CEO of Diadem. Uh, Myself and my co-founder just recently completed a different accelerator program called Indie Bio, a biotech accelerator program uh, in San Francisco. Uh, And now we're back in LA. We make exosome therapeutics. And I'll tell you all about exosomes and exosome therapeutics. Cells that are touching are in constant communication, but for cells to communicate at a distance, they use secreted vesicles called exosomes. And exosomes were originally thought to be cellular garbage, but now exosomes are a a hot new area for therapeutics. Our competitors are focused on what they can put inside of exosomes to deliver into cells but we're focused on engineering the outside of exosomes to control cells through their surface receptors. And to do this, we engineer the genetic code of immortalized human cells so that the exosomes come out with therapeutically valuable signaling proteins on them. We can determine their exact size and concentration, and we know the number of signaling molecules on their surface so we can be consistent in our manufacture and our dosing. And by putting signaling agonists on the exosomes, we're creating a new therapeutic modality that will eclipse cell therapies and biologics. And I say this confidently because we discovered a a very simple concept at IndieBio just a few months ago. When we take a cell signaling protein and express it on the surface of an exosome, it's 10,000 times more potent than the unattached protein. So let's look at this a little bit in depth. PD-1 is a co-inhibitory receptor that controls the activity of immune cells like T cells. On the right are two purified signaling proteins that bind to this receptor. You can see they produce some signal, but it is very, very weak. In contrast, these same proteins expressed on our exosomes become extremely powerful and potent. And they're doing this at a drastically lower dose. And so what we realized is that this is the difference between a research tool on the right and a therapeutically viable platform on the left. So let me explain why being able to do this is so important in our field. On the left is receptor superclustering when cells contact. 
Since the development of human monoclonal antibodies, pharma has been trying to engineer ones that can mimic the stimulating agonistic signaling. They've gotten really good at blocking signaling, but agonist signaling hasn't worked. They can't get this super clustering effect. And what we've created here, the capability to do this is a game changer for biotech. In the little time we had left during our acceleration, we performed a proof of principle animal study to test our engineered exosomes in vivo. And we hadn't optimized the dose at all. We were just looking for a biological signal. So let me walk you through the data. Rats immunized with a retinal antigen develop a severe autoimmune inflammation in their eyes. D disease begins at about day six and peaks at around day 12. Injection into the eye of saline or an unmodified exosome had identical disease progression. In contrast, there was a significant attenuation of disease progression with a single injection of our engineered exosomes. And just as we expected, there was a half-life and the effect wore off. But a second injection seemed to have some effect on the resolution. And we saw similar effects when the exosomes were injected intravenously, a different route of administration. So this was just our first in vivo experiment, but we were really excited. It was disease modifying, it had a half-life and drug-like behavior. We're now optimizing these experiments and, and continuing our, um, our development. And in addition to optimizing these PD-1 agonists, we're now making multi-specific exosomes with combinations of clinically important signaling molecules. The potency and versatility enables targeting an extremely wide range of diseases, including cancers, infectious, and neurodegenerative diseases. Um, and this really is too many opportunities for one company. So, so we wanna develop assets that we can partner out, but also have our own clinical programs, which will focus on specific inflammatory diseases with unmet needs. So let me talk about how we manufacture our therapeutic exosomes. So we're hard at work harvesting, concentrating, and purifying exosomes at lab feasible scales. But with a leading bioprocess lab, we developed a CGMP compliant scalable process for exosome production from our cell lines. And this upstream bioprocess uses no animal derived ancillary materials, enabling easy downstream purification and ensuring clinical regulatory compliance. To produce our therapeutic consistently and affordably, we took advantage of the fact that exosomes are the size of viruses. And we realized that we could apply vaccine manufacturing technologies to our downstream manufacturing. We developed our own workflow to concentrate and separate our exosomes from other biomolecules produced by the cells. And importantly, exosomes are more affordable, stable, and dosable than cell therapies, which are a logistical mess for a lot of reasons. And because exosomes are remarkably robust entities, we're working on new delivery formats, including inhalable. Direct delivery of shelf-stable exosomes opens opportunities to target rare and common diseases, some with huge markets. And we're confident in our new modality and platform, and we welcome the biotech industry to come partner with us. One of our key clinical targets is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. COPD is a growing global problem and the third leading cause of death by disease. And COPD results in nearly 50 billion per year in direct medical costs. It's a huge problem. And despite its $14 billion market, there are currently no disease modifying therapies. But we also realized while working on our approach for COPD that we also have an approach for COVID-19. We're seeing that the mortality is due to the host immune response that causes severe cytokine storm and can damage the lungs. We're developing various exosome therapeutics that can modulate the activity of the immune cells that cause the inflammation. We just submitted a discovery grant to the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine, and we hope that they're willing to fund us. We've assembled great scientific medical and business advisors to help us reach our goals. Diadem is co-founded by Dr. Wojtek Barkowski, a brilliant biologist and technologist. He and I have been colleagues and friends for a decade since we were postdoctoral fellows at the same lab at UCLA. I went on to work in biotech and he gained experience in intellectual property as a technical consultant for a leading IP firm. And we've assembled council that has expertise in building biotech companies and even in prosecuting exosome technologies. 
So we intend to occupy a very large position in this rapidly advancing field. We founded the company in LA a year ago and then spent six months, September to the end of February, accelerating at IndieBio. We're now back in LA working out of a lab in Torrance. We share space with Pathways to Stem Cell Science and Education and uh, Research Nonprofit and Karma Biotechnologies, another biotech company to keep your eyes on. And we've mapped out our milestones and use of funds to create tremendous value. We're continuing to develop our exosome and cell engineering technologies. We're de-risking the uses of exosomes therapeutically and we're initiating preclinical studies. And we're opening a $1.25 million pre-seed round to create the therapeutic modality of the future. Thank you, I'll take questions. Awesome. Hey, so my, my first question, if you could go back, I think it was maybe your second slide. Yeah. I'll ask a question more. Um, no, slide number five, sorry. I think it was slide number five. Tell me when to stop. Right there. So yeah. you could, and you can put up the, uh, the other lines here. So I guess this is either the, the question you love or the question you hate, but does this always work? Or are you showing us two examples where it worked really well, but heck, the, the universe of proteins is big and it, it sometimes works really well. It sometimes works so, so well, and sometimes works really well. How, how, do, you, how do you help the non-scientists understand how applicable this technology is across the universe? Yeah, so this is a good question and it speaks to our platform. So for these uh, specific proteins, it works really, really well. And uh, all of these proteins target a single receptor, PD-1. And PD-1 is, is among a class of uh, co-stimulatory co or co-inhibitory receptors that are found on T cells. Um, and, and the kind of universal commonality uh, is that these receptors not only require binding by their ligand, but they also require a physical clustering on the cell surface. And so we believe that by adding uh, signaling proteins on the surface of the exosomes, these very small 100 nanometer particles, that they're able to bind the receptors and cluster them and create a more potent uh, signaling. And so that's what I was getting at here with this receptor uh, super clustering. So I gave just one example but there's at least dozens, if not many, many more examples. Um, and so that's why it allows us to target lots of different diseases in lots of different ways um, by targeting this common theme in cellular signaling. And as I mentioned, um, uh, there's a class of antibodies called agonistic antibodies. They're, they're antibodies that can bind and also signal through the receptors that they bind. And one of the challenges with making agonistic antibodies is they just don't have that clustering effect. Um, and this is a known problem in biopharma where, um, where uh, antagonist antibodies, antibodies that block things or bind things and soak them up from the bloodstream work really well. But antibodies that actually cause signaling events are hard to develop. Um, and then they don't have the potency needed to be applicable uh, as a therapeutic. Got it. Um, yeah, so we have a we have a whole library of proteins we're now playing with and, and developing assays for. Uh, just a comment and then a question. Um, a comment would be um, when when discussing the company, especially with non scientists like myself, I think it's helpful to. I, I would just kind of change the structure of of how you tell the story of the company. Start with the problem, then go to the team, and then go into the science. Um, you know, just just that helps sort of for non-technical and non-medical people help frame the story a little bit better. So I would just think about flipping it, but um, can we talk about the product and the price, which I know in biotech is sort of uncertain, mm -hmm. but, but, but just like walk us and, and other listeners through this, let's say it works. How do you end up productizing this? And then, and then how do you even think about pricing or does this, I mean, go, what is the product and price eventually? Yeah, so you know, right now, our in terms of manufacturing cogs, um, we are probably more expensive than most biologics, um, but significantly less expensive than cell therapies. And so, um, right now, even biologics are are very very expensive. People will spend sixty to one hundred thousand dollars per year for medications like Humira and other biologics. 
Um, so I think we have an opportunity to kind of bend the cost curve of, of manufacturing and, and have a, a product that's competitive. And the advantage that we have over, um, over biologics is that we can initiate certain types of signaling that most of those biologics can't and don't do very well. And then on the other side, cell therapies, as we know, are exceedingly expensive, hundreds of thousands of dollars. And so they're really only applicable to all but the most rare and severe diseases. And so the types of signaling that you can get with a cell therapy are, is the type of thing that we're going for with our engineered exosome. And so we're really trying to compete with the cell therapies um, in terms of, of, of cost. So we're still working out our COGS um, and, and, and developing our processes. Um, in terms of pricing, I mean, that, that comes down to kind of very high level kind of pay or payee considerations with, um, with healthcare and what you can actually price a drug for a certain indication. So we haven't quite, you know, uh, done a full analysis of that. And, and almost the, the next obvious question to Spencer's is, what do you, what does this journey look like? It's, it's a, I wouldn't even want to take a guess at whether or not you're, you're six months away from plugging in the cash register, or are you six years away from plugging in the cash register in terms of, you know, be, being ready to go to market or have somebody else take it to market for you? Yeah. So this is, this, this comes down to, you know, what, what will be our business model and how will we you know, get to market and how will we generate revenue? And so we envision ourselves as kind of a hybrid business model. Um, there's another uh, biotech company here in LA. It's a public company called Zencor, X-E-N-C-O-R. Um, they're an antibody platform company and uh, they do antibody engineering better than everybody else, right? And so what we anticipate is that uh, by riding the trends in the exosome field, we will be the leaders at engineering exosomes, and we will be able to develop uh, some pharma partnerships to co-develop new types of biologics and to help them solve these problems of signaling that they're encountering. So while we want to have our own clinical programs, we also want to start uh, doing some business development with pharma and seeing how we can leverage our platform technologies to help them. And so that's, that's in some sense how we want to start generating uh, revenue. Um, in terms of the clinical pipeline, you're, you're right, it takes years, right? A decade and a billion dollars for your typical <laughs> biopharmaceutical product. Um, and so the, the key would be to uh, be acquired by a large pharma partner, maybe phase two, somewhere about halfway through this process. Um, and then they can help us take it across the finish line and commercialize. And so that, that's, uh, that's kind of our goal. All right, Jay Spencer, any final thoughts for Mickey? I uh, hope it works. Uh, we, um, I mean, it, it, amazing, amazing technology, a huge problem, obviously. And um, yeah, good luck. Well, well we're excited and uh, we're ambitious and, and we're here to build a biotech community in LA. So uh, I hope people who are out there listening, uh, reach out to us and uh, let's see how we can form partnerships and uh, get things moving. Very cool. All right, great. Well, that wraps up our showcase. Thank you so much to our judges, Jay and Spencer, for your time and expertise. I personally found it quite fascinating to get a window into how you think about investing in the healthcare and biotech space. So thanks so much for it. <laughs> Um, and then also thank you to our three companies, Giblib, Tot Squad, and Diadem Biotherapeutics for sharing the truly exciting things you're working on. And finally, thank you so much to you, our audience. We are thrilled to continue connecting with you and bringing the best in the LA tech media startup space to you. So if you want to connect with any of these companies, contact information is going to be available in the write-up on our website later. And if you want more content from .LA, go check out our website, sign up for our newsletter, and follow us on social media so that you won't miss a single update and our daily video content. And finally, if you enjoyed today's event, which I hope that you did, you're in luck. We have lots more for you. Our pitch showcase happens every other week, but we also run strategy sessions every Tuesday at 11 a.m. Pacific, which we focus on a different topic every week. On the weeks that we don't run our showcase, we hold Dot LA Convenes, which is a speaker series focused on empowering women in tech. So look out for that next Thursday. 
All right, that is it from me. Thanks so much for tuning in and thank you again to our judges and our presenters. Thanks, Kelly.